Welcome back to Carnades.org. Today we're going to be continuing our series, You Can't Handle the Truth, looking at Alfred Tarski's theory of truth. Particularly, we are going to be finally finishing Alfred Tarski's theory of truth, looking at the indefinability of truth, also known as Tarski's theorem. Now, Tarski was not only famous for showing that the liar paradox may be avoided with a system of meta-languages. Arguably, check out my video on Tarski and the Liar Paradox for some of my objections to that claim, but also for demonstrating that without such a system, truth cannot be defined. So, if you think that some of my objections were persuasive there, then you might come to the conclusion that truth can't be defined, period, with a meta language or with anything. In this video, we're going to show how Tarski used girdle numbers to prove that truth cannot be defined within any language. If you've not watched the previous video on girdle numbering and you're not pretty familiar with some of those concepts, I would highly recommend that you do so. Even if you're already familiar with those concepts, this video is going to be really helpful with you to understand this video and what's going on here. It's also interesting to note that girdle arguably proved a very similar, if not the same, idea separately while he was proving the incompleteness theorems. But this idea is known as Tarski's theorem because it's based off of some of his ideas around convention T and the way that we can define truth. So, going to the liar's paradox, one problem that you may notice with the liar's paradox is how exactly it accomplishes self reference. So I name some statement, statement L, and then have my statement be, statement L is not true. Well, with our predicate calculus, we don't really have a rule that says you can kind of name a statement. We don't have something that I can put in that statement that actually tells me that this statement is statement L. And many people kind of note this problem by saying, well, using identity substitution, the only really way that we can reference this statement is by plugging the statement in for itself, which is statement L is not true is not true. And clearly this is going to devolve into an infinite regress and we're never actually going to be able to name this statement itself. You may think that this is a problem for the liar's paradox. However, Tarski and Gödel are going to demonstrate a way that we can actually get around this problem, okay? So, if you're here because you think that this is a problem for the liar's paradox, here is how we're going to prove that it's not. It's going to be a little complicated and roundabout, but by the end of the video, we're going to come back to showing how we can solve this problem for the liar's paradox and demonstrate that this really still is a paradox, and truth can't be defined within a language. This is where Gödel's numbers are going to come into play. Since any statement can be uniquely identified by its Gödel number, we can use Gödel numbers to directly reference a statement containing a Gödel number, even if that Gödel number is the number representing the statement itself. Using this method, we're going to avoid the regress, because we're not going to have a place where you could plug in this statement, because we don't directly reference this statement in our liar's paradox. So, looking to the side, you'll see we have a bunch of translations of numbers into propositional symbols. These are going to be the numbers that we're going to use to translate particular symbols in propositional calculus. Note we don't have all of the symbols of propositional calculus and we're not going to be using something like successorship. We're just going to be defining each of the individual digits separately when we're representing numbers here, just to be simple so we don't have to go through any of that. If this looks confusing to you and you don't understand, watch the previous video on definitions of girdle numbers. Remember that we will use QNM to mean that if you plug the girdle number n into the statement represented by the girdle number n in all the slots where there are free variables, then you will get the statement represented by the girdle number m. Additionally, we will take tn to mean that the statement represented by the girdle number n is true. Note that t in this case is not taking as its object a proposition, but rather a girdle number. 
which is going to come into play when we understand what exactly we're going to have these map onto in terms of object language and meta language. But T only quantifies over numbers, not over propositions. And what it means is that the arithmetization of that number is true. That statement which we can get from arithmetizing that number is true. Okay? Now, this will allow us to create the paradox by using the following statement. There exists some n such that it's not the case that tn and the arithmetization of the following number is n. So that number is 3233 Okay? And then followed by n. And that last comma there isn't part of the number, but rather the separation of the two parts of our Q relation. Now, if you want to practice arithmetization yourself, try to translate that number into what statement it is. But if you've already done that, let's follow and check your work. So, if I've put the numbers in correctly, if translated, that girdle number of the above number in that statement, the translation of it will be, there exists some n such that it's not the case that tn and qm n. Okay? If there's a mistake in that number somewhere, I apologize, this is what it should translate to. All right? Hopefully, you can kind of guess where we're going with this. If you can't, we're going to break it down individually, first by understanding exactly what that statement means, and then by showing how it creates a paradox. So, we can translate this statement as there exists some girdle number n, such that it is not the case that the statement which corresponds to that number is true, and that number is the arithmetization of the formula created by plugging this long number into the formula created by arithmetizing that same number might be a little confusing, so let's look at another explanation. There is some number, n, that represents a statement p. It is not the case that p is true, and if we substitute this number, written here, in for all the free variables in the formula created by arithmetizing that same number, then the resulting formula will be p. Okay? Because n is the girdle number that corresponds to p, the resulting formula from plugging that long number into itself is going to be p. All right? Hopefully that makes a little bit more sense, but if it's still confusing, let's simplify it farther. There exists some number n, which represents a statement p, and is not true. If we plug the number, which represents this whole thing, into itself, for the free variable m, we will get p. All right? That seems pretty simplified to me. Hopefully it makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, we're actually going to keep using this statement and show why it turns into a paradox. So hopefully those applications of this statement will make you understand this, or you can just go back and take a look at those three translations of this statement, and maybe one of them will make sense to you. So, before we get to how this statement is paradoxical, we must remember convention T. Think of the object language as the language of girdle numbers, and the arithmetization as the process of translating into a meta language. This is why T, our predicate, applies over numbers, not over propositions, because girdle numbers are the object language, and we're trying to define a truth predicate for an object language, whereas the translations into propositions are kind of our meta language. Some predicate in the meta language T will be considered adequate if and only if the following theorems can be proven within that meta language. All theorems of the form Tn is materially equivalent to P, where N is a particular girdle number and P is the translation of that girdle number. And that for all M, if 
TM can be proven in the meta language, then M is a well formed formula or sentence of the object language. The problem is, of course, that we have somewhere in our object language a representation of T, that truth predicate for that language itself. As soon as you have that, you're going to end up with a contradiction. And that's what we're going to show here. So, let's look at why this is a paradox. Imagine that this statement is true. That means that it is not the case that the proposition represented by n is true. So, this statement is true, and the proposition represented by n is, it's not the case that that statement is true. So, we have a problem if this statement ends up being the proposition represented by n from the first half of the conjunction. However, the second half of the conjunction says that the proposition represented by n is this statement, or what you get when you plug this number into the arithmetization of itself, which is going to result in the original formula. Hopefully you can clearly see that. All that the statement above is, is if we get rid of m in that second statement and put in that long number. Therefore, the arithmetization of n is the original formula, and as we said, that's going to be a problem because it's going to violate convention t. While it's not the case that tn, which we got from the first half of the conjunction, the translation of n into the meta language, which just is the original statement based on the second half of the conjunction, is true from the second half of the conjunction, not disjunction. So, for any truth predicate, if this statement is true, convention T is violated. So with our current tools of predicate calculus, we can't actually prove this line by line, but we can come a little bit close. So assume indirect proof this statement is true. And then we can get from simplification both not T, N, and Q, that long number, N. By arithmetizing this number, we can see that n is the girdle number of the original statement. This is the part that we don't really have the mechanics to do yet, is the actual process of arithmetization. But if you do it on your own, you should clearly see that n is the girdle number of the original statement. If that's the case, then convention t must hold, because n, when translated into the meta language, is just going to be p, where p is just the original statement. However, we've assumed that the statement is true, yet we also have, it's not the case, that Tn, which implies, through that material equivalence in convention T, that P must also not be the case. Therefore, convention T is violated. However, this alone does not create a paradox, since this statement could simply be false for all truth predicates. This means that for all numbers n, either the proposition that n represents is true, or it is not the case that plugging this long number into the arithmetization of itself will result in n. That's just kind of a De Morgan's law plugged in there. Let's universally instantiate n as the number that represents the original formula, making the second half of our disjunction, it's a disjunction this time, false. However, if n is the number that represents the original formula, then convention t will also be violated, since our first stipulation was that the original formula was false, but it must be the case that tn by disjunctive syllogism, because we've shown that q is true, and therefore the second half of our disjunction is going to be false. There's some tricky work with negations in there, so let's take a look at how we could do this in another way. So once again, our predicate calculus is not going to be expressive enough to prove this step by step, but we can present a sim simpler version. If we assume the original statement is false, once again, assumed indirect proof, by change of quantifier to get a universal quantifier over n, De Morgan's law to distribute the negation across the conjunction and turn it into a disjunction, and double negation to get rid of the two negations in front of the tn, we can get for all n, t, n, or it's not the case that q, all of that, n. We then instantiate n as the number that will make q, all of that, n true, which happens to be the girdle number of the original statement, as we've already shown. By disjunctive syllogism, we can then conclude that t, n, because we have the denial of the second half of our disjunction, and since n is the girdle number of the original statement p, that means that convention t must hold. And 
Tn is materially equivalent to P. However, our original assumption was that the original statement was false. But we also have to conclude that Tn is the case. Therefore, we have a contradiction, and no truth predicate will be sufficient to uphold convention T if the above statement is either true or false. The above statement is well formed. Since we do not directly represent the statement itself in the proposition anywhere, we will not have the problem that we discussed originally for the liar's paradox of infinite regress, since there's nowhere to plug the statement into. If you change the number above into a formula and then try to plug it in for that m, then the arithmoquine relation will not hold, since it only holds over numbers, not formulas. So the formula won't be the same, and it won't be identical to the original statement as we had with the original liar's paradox problem. How then can Tarski's solution avoid this paradoxical statement? According to Tarski's convention T, we can't have a truth predicate for a language represented in that language. Therefore, 777, which represents T, our truth predicate attempting to predicate over our girdle number language, makes the number not a well-formed formula for our object language. Hopefully this series has given you a basic understanding of Alfred Tarski's theories of truth. In the future, we will look to doing a more in-depth series on Gödel and his incompleteness theorems. For a basic introduction, check out the video on Gödel's incompleteness theorems here on this channel. Whew, that was, who is Alfred Tarski? What's a formal language? Convention T, Tarski and the liar paradox, what is a Gödel number? And finally, the indefinability of truth. For our mini-series within You Can't Handle the Truth, we have finally finished, and we can go back to the main series. So that has been You Can't Handle the Truth, Truth Makers, Correspondence Theory of Truth, Identity Theory of Truth, Coherence, Pragmatism, Deflationary, Pluralist, Tarski's Theory of Truth. Next up, we're going to be looking at Kripke, Revisionist Theories of Truth, and the Two Truths of Tibet. Check out the SCP for more information on Tarski, and watch this video and more here at Carnades.org. Stay skeptical, everybody.